Enzymes and concept of metabolism. This is related to another topic. Enzymes and concept of metabolism. So the way these chemical events happening in the body are catalyzed by certain chemicals in other form. They are called as the enzymes. So without which we cannot accelerate the rate of chemical reactions. So in some cases, you know that when the rate of chemical reactions are increased by thousand times, hundred times, or even million times because of the presence of enzymes. So we have to do, go through first about the enzymes and then we have to just go in the metabolism. A few words more. You know very well about metabolism. Almost all biochemical reactions taking place in the body together constitute the metabolism. Some of the reactions are synthetic reactions and some others are destructive reactions leading to anabolism and catabolism, the growth and energy productions. Now, let's go to the enzymes first. What are enzymes? See, normally the enzymes actually complex catalyst. Complex catalyst. We can also use the word complex biocatalyst because they are secreted by the living cells. Any complex catalyst, a chemical, which is being secreted with the living cells is called as biocatalyst. So enzymes are biocatalysts. So they are having a high efficiency of creating a biochemical reaction. And also they are having a high specificity, high degree of specificity. What is the meaning for that specificity? A particular enzyme is creating only a particular reaction. It cannot have the ability of creating some other reaction. So all the reactions are specified. A particular reaction is catalyzed only by a specific enzyme. For example, the proteolytic enzyme breaks down only the proteins. A carbohydrate splitting enzyme breaks down only the carbohydrates. That is called the specificity. So all the enzymes have high degree of specificity. And also they are having more efficiency because they are creating biochemical reactions. So they permit actually the bio bio biological reactions or biochemical reactions happens to occur. Biological reaction or biochemical reaction happens to occur. That is uh, rapidly. So if there the help of enzymes, the rate of reaction is not accelerated. The reaction being accelerated only with the help of enzymes. So we need enzymes badly. That is why they are considered as complex catalysts produced by the living cells, having a high degree of specificity and efficiency. And they also permit the biological reactions or the biochemical reactions just to occur rapidly through specified pathways or well-defined pathways. We have different pathways, what we call this one the metabolic pathways, we'll see later. Now, how can we separate the enzymes? What is the chemical nature of the enzymes? So normally we are adapting one method to separate and isolate the enzymes. The method adapted for separation and isolation of enzymes is called a paper chromatography or simply chromatograph. The method adapted for isolating enzymes, for separating enzymes, called the chromatograph. Then what is the chemical nature of enzymes? All enzymes are exclusively proteins. It is not made up of any other chemical substance. All enzymes are exclusively proteins. Suppose you are taking the hormones, the hormones are of diverse chemical nature. They may be of proteins or steroids or derivatives of amino acids, etc. But here enzymes are exclusively proteins, they are made up of only proteins. Some enzymes are made up of only single proteins and others are made up of conjugated proteins. See, most enzymes are simple, made up of simple proteins. And some of them are made up of conjugated proteins, a combination of some. And we have different types of enzymes. One such enzyme normally used in the case of uh, biotechnology, ribozymes. So what do you mean by ribozymes? As we have in the syllabus, we have to say a few words about that one. Now some of the nucleic acids behave like enzymes, particularly the RNAs. What form? For cleaving up, the RNAs are specific places in in vitro, outside the body. Such nucleic acids, particularly the RNAs, which behave like enzymes for cleaving or for breaking, the RNAs are specific places in what is called in vitro or homos ribosomes. Okay, what is the structure of enzyme? 
If you analyze the nature of proteins under the biomolecules, we are going to take this one later after finishing this one, different types of biomolecules. You know we have the biomolecules in the body, the carbohydrates, the proteins, the nucleic acids, the fats, etc. These are all different biomolecules. So one of the biomolecules in the body is nothing but the proteins. I mentioned already, normally the enzymes are exclusively proteins. So enzyme, the proteins are actually taking different profiles. They may be in the form of antigens and antibodies. See the hormones. They are taking different profile. And also they have different structure. Either in the form of primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure. A primary structure is nothing but a long chain, a linear chain of amino acids. If we are taking a secondary structure, it will come later under biomolecules. It is in the form of alpha helix or in the form of beta sheet. So this is what is called the secondary structure of a, the secondary structure of protein. The secondary structure of proteins. So it may be in the form of alpha helix or in the form of what is called the beta sheet, like this. This is what is called the beta sheet. That is called the secondary structure. The proteins also exist in a tertiary form, a three-dimensional structure. So that is what is called a tertiary structure and also we have quaternary structure and so on. So an enzyme like protein, an enzyme like protein has a primary structure, a secondary structure or a tertiary structure. Now let us check the tertiary structure. What will happen in the tertiary structure of the protein? So the tertiary structure, if you are taking the backbone of the protein chain, it normally falls upon itself like this, folding. Fold upon its folding. And also the chain crisscrosses. Crisscrosses means in a zigzag manner. This is what is called crisscrosses. So the proteins normally fold upon itself. And the chain crisscrosses itself. Crisscrosses upon itself. So that we can have a number of pockets. Now these are all the pockets we can have. So when the proteins are actually folded upon folded upon themselves, so we are, when we are taking the backbone of the protein, the tertiary protein, when it is folding upon itself, when the chain crisscrosses itself, then we can have a number of pockets. Some grooves are made. And these are all what are called the pockets or the clubs of proteins particularly in the case of enzymes. And these pockets are very important in doing the activity of what is called the catalytic action. We can say the biocatalytic action and simply catalytic action. The grooves or the pockets or the clubs are responsible for carrying out the catalytic activity. So this is actually what we have the enzymes formation. That's why I written here also. The backbone of the protein chain falls upon itself. The chain crisscross is moving in a zigzag manner. So that what we have a number of pockets. And one such pocket or all these pockets together we can say active site. What I mentioned the cleft or pockets are considered as an active site. So the active site is very important for fitting of a, a substrate into the enzyme. So we need the formation of substrate enzyme complex only when we have the substrate being fit into that is what is called the active site. Then only it is being stimulated, some changes, chemical changes, the breaking the bonds, formation of bonds, all being taken place only when we have the binding of the substrate with the active site. You'll see the mechanism of action. Now, what do you mean by an active site? Simply I mentioned it's nothing but a pocket or a cleft. So, an active site of enzyme is nothing but a crevice or a pocket, some deep cavities. That is what is called a crevice or pocket. So in which normally the substrate fits. So because of the presence of these active sites only, they are playing major role in bringing about the catalytic reactions in a number of uh, that is living cells. So through their active sites, the enzymes catalyze reactions at high rate. So if you compare the enzyme accelerated reactions, uh, reactions without what is called enzymes, you can have an example also. The rate at which normally the chemical reactions occurs by using the enzymes is always at a higher rate than that of those reactions which we call this one uncatalyzed reactions without the help of enzymes. Now we have both organic and inorganic catalysts. So inorganic catalysts what we are using in chemical laboratories, organic catalysts nothing but the enzymes form inside the body. 
Now, what is the main difference between these two? So, enzyme catalyst normally differ from the inorganic catalyst what we are using in chemical reactions normally. Enzymes are used in living cells and the inorganic catalysts are now used outside the living cells in chemical laboratories. Now, what is the difference? Suppose you are taking inorganic catalyst, anything else. So, they can have high stability and also they can have the ability of working efficiently even at high temperatures, even at high pressures. But when you are taking the enzyme, they cannot have the ability to work at higher temperatures. They can be denatured because all enzymes are proteins. Proteins cannot tolerate a high temperature above 40 degrees Celsius. So that is the main difference. So the inorganic catalyst can work best efficiently even at high temperatures and pressures. Whereas the enzymes as proteins, they can be denatured above 40 degrees Celsius. That means at high temperature. That is why we need an optimum temperature for the enzyme to work. Most of the enzymes are not working above the temperature. But we have certain enzymes secreted by the living cells who can maintain their stability and also they can maintain their what we have the catalytic power even at high temperatures. We have one bacteria what is called Thermus aquaticus. Thermus aquaticus. This is the name of the bacterium normally used in the case of for example polymerase chain reaction in the production of for example many chains of uh, nucleic acids in vitro in in vitro we are making or manipulating the DNA or synthesizing DNA so and such enzymes there are some enzymes released by living organisms and those organisms can survive in high temperatures for example the hot vents just coming out the water that is coming from uh, the ground level with the hot temperature even in the case of sulfur springs where the temperature is high and they can have the ability to maintain their stability and also maintain their ability to catalyze the reaction and such one enzyme what we have very important enzyme released from bacteria TAQ packed DNA polymerase T for Thermus, AQ Aquaticus, Thermus Aquaticus. There is a name of the bacterium which can live in high temperature even more than you see that one 80 to 90 degrees Celsius. This bacteria can live even more than 100 degrees Celsius. So 80 to 90. Not only the bacterium is surviving, the enzyme is actually not being degenerated, not being destroyed at high temperature. Say an example of TAQ DNA polymerase, Thermus Aquaticus DNA polymerase. The most important enzyme normally used in the case of lengthening or polymerization of DNA. Then, so in such organisms, and normally we call that organism thermophilic organisms. So in such thermophilic organisms, the thermal stability that is actually is an important factor as they have the ability to withstand high temperature. So thermal stability is an important quality of enzymes in the case of thermophilic organisms. Those organisms like in very hot temperature are called thermophilic organisms. So one such example, though the enzymes are being destroyed above 40 degrees Celsius, as they cannot have the ability to tolerate high temperatures, but one such enzyme, so one exclusively, that is enzyme present in the case of hot climatic conditions, pack DNA polymerase. Nothing but thermus aquaticus. That is the name of the bacterium. From that only it is being isolated. Now, say in the body we have a number of reactions going on. We call that one chemical reactions. Normally, if you are taking any chemical compound, either organic compound or inorganic compound, they undergo two types of changes. One, a physical change. That is change in shape. Or change actually in state of matter. Change in state of matter either from solid to liquid or liquid to gas like that. So that is called a physical change. And uh, other change is nothing but a chemical reaction, a chemical change. So in a chemical reaction, what, what we have normally, what is happening? So nothing but the bonds are broken or bonds are added. Just actually during transformation process from one substance to another, either the bonds are being broken or the bonds are being actually added. So that is what is called a chemical reaction. 
So the bonds are broken or new bonds are added during the transformation process. Transformation, nothing but the substrate into product. That process called transformation from one form to another. Okay. So a chemical reaction, again, there are two types of chemical reaction. One organic chemical reaction, another one just inorganic chemical reaction. So almost all the reactions happening inside the body, even in the case of digestive system, one example is given. An organic chemical reaction is nothing but you see that one hydrolysis of starch, breakdown of starch with the help of enzymes or like amylase. So it is an example for organic chemical reaction, always happening in the body. And an example for inorganic chemical reaction here, just one example given. So barium hydroxide, when treated with the sulfuric acid, we have barium sulfate and then water product. So this is an example for inorganic chemical reaction. And hydrolysis of any food product, the breakdown of any food product, either carbohydrate or proteins or lipids, then it's an example for organic chemical reaction. Then we'll pass on to the next part. So, what do you mean by a rate of a physical and chemical process? How can you calculate? What do you mean by that one? The rate of a physical or the velocity of a physical or chemical process. So it refers to you see that one, the amount of product formed per unit of time. So, the rate is equal to delta just P, the product, and divided by delta T, the time. So, how can you calculate the rate of any chemical reaction or a physical reaction? That is, I am using the word chemical or physical reaction or simply the process. So, it refers to the amount of product form. How much amount of product form in a given time? Say, an example, one hour or two hours or one day or one minute as in the case of for example calculating the calorie value and that is what is called the rate so rate is equal to delta p divided by delta t and also the rate can also be expressed in velocity when the direction is specified once the direction is specified in which direction the reaction is going on then we are calling this one rate as velocity so rate or velocity can be used to calculate actually what is the speed at which any physical or chemical process or chemical reaction takes place? Now we have a number of physical and chemical events. The rate of physical and chemical events are normally affected by a number of factors. One such most important factor along with other factors is nothing but temperature. So of all the factors, the temperature is the most important factor affecting the rate of any reaction. Any reaction. Now, so, while we have the temperature, so the rate of the reaction either doubles, it is being multiplied, it is being increased, or it decreases. The rate of reaction either doubles, that is increases, or decreases by half. So, it is being increased two times, or it is being decreased by actually half. 50% weight loss, the rate of reaction. How? For every 10 degree change in temperature, for every 10 degree change in temperature, suppose we are doing the reaction at 40 degrees Celsius. So the rate of reaction is under optimal condition. When we are increasing the temperature to 50, in some cases, what will happen? The rate of reaction is double. But in some cases, the rate of reaction is decreased by half. Instead of having normal reaction of 100%, it is decreased by 50%. So we have only the 50% products. In some cases, we are getting 200 just a percentage of products when we are using a normal product of 100% or a substrate. So, change in temperature for every 10 degree Celsius is the main cause of either increasing even our salivary amylase. The salivary amylase activity has been increased or decreased according to the temperature available in the body. So, anyway, the rate of chemical reaction is affected by temperature. Either it increases the reaction by or doubling the reactions or decreasing the reaction by just half for every 10 degree Celsius. Now, actually when a reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme, that reaction occurs at most a higher rate than that of the reaction which is being uncatalyzed. Uncatalyzed means not enzyme being used. So that's why you use the statement. So catalyst reactions normally proceed at rates mostly higher than that of uncatalyzed ones. Here gives one example in the body living body. 
See the carbon dioxide that is released by the cells being transported in different forms in the form of carbonic acid, in the form of bicarbonate, in the form of carbon monocombins, etc. So as soon as normally carbon dioxide reaches the bed, it is being hydrated. So it combines with water to form carbonic acid, a weak acid and stable acid. Suppose let us assume no enzyme activity for this reaction. So in the absence of enzyme, what I mentioned, carbonic anhydrase, if this reaction is catalyzed without the help of enzyme, how much or how many number of carbonic acid molecules form? See, in the absence of any enzyme, the reaction, the rate of reaction is very slow. And it has been experimentally proved in the absence of enzyme carbonic hydrate, carbonic anhydrase. It is also called the fastest enzyme. It is also called the fastest enzyme among the living world, carbonic anhydrase. So the rate of reaction is very slow here with about, I mentioned only 200 carbonic acid molecules. 200 carbonic acid molecules being formed in one hour, not in one second. When the same reaction is catalyzed by carbonic anhydrase, see that for how much number of carbonic acid molecules, nearly 600,000 or 6 lakh, that is what we call the carbonic acid molecules form, not in one hour, but in one second. So you see that one, the enzyme accelerated the rate of reaction. How much times here? 10 million. So in the absence of enzyme, the rate of reaction is very slow. We have received only just 200 molecules of carbonic acid in one hour. Once enzyme is there, now what will happen? The speed of the reaction has been dramatically increased. The speed of the reaction has been dramatically increased because of the effect of enzyme. A2. So we are getting nearly 600,000 molecules of carbonic acid in one second, not one hour. Even one. By 60, actually that is one hour, in about 3600 seconds, such number, but here in one second, you can calculate. That is why you see that when the enzyme is accelerated the reaction by about 10 million times. That is why we are getting such huge number of carbonic acid. Now what is the metabolic problem? So it is nothing but actually a stepwise conversion of one substance into another. And each step is catalyzed by an enzyme complex, a normal enzyme complex. That is actually the same enzyme complex we can see, or different enzymes. Then it is called a metabolic point. So it is nothing but a multi-step chemical reaction. Here it is given. I mentioned it is nothing but a stepwise conversion of one substance into another, resulting in the formation of a product from the substrate. That is why here I have given that it is multi-step chemical reaction. When each step is catalyzed by the same enzyme complex or different enzymes, then it is called a metabolic path. Here, given one example, in the case of metabolism of glucose, there are two stages. One happens in the cytoplasm, another one occurs inside the mitochondria. So first, actually the glucose is being broken down into pyruvic acid, a three carbon hormone in the cytoplasm. The name of the process is called glycolysis. The name of the process is called glycolysis. And there you have received two molecules of three carbon compound from actually a six carbon compound glucose by oxidation process. Actually, it occurs in the absence of oxygen in the cytoplasm, leading to the formation of pyruvate and pyruvic acid. But this conversion of this glucose into pyruvic acid not takes place in a simple step but in more actually intense steps carried out by 10 different enzymes. Glucose first converted to glucose 6 phosphate, then fractose 6 phosphate, fractose 1 6 diphosphate, like that. The first enzyme hexokinase, like that. We have, so anyway, we have a chemical reaction is proceeding in many steps, and such a multi step reaction is called what is known as metabolic point. So we can say also, actually, I will present that uh, illustration later. So. And uh, the metabolic pathway is responsible for stepwise conversion of one substance named the substrate into the product in between which we have a number of intermediate altered substrate, what are called the intermediate products. 
So, we have also under different conditions, different products are formed. The same glucose oxidation, for example, under normal conditions, under normal conditions, in our body, it results in the formation of pyruvic acid. In the same skeletal muscle. Suppose you are taking skeletal muscles, here we have tested it, under normal conditions, we have formed the pyruvic acid. Under abnormal conditions in the absence of oxygen in the skeletal muscles, instead of forming the pyruvic acid or even the pyruvic acid is formed, later it is soon transferred into lactic acid. This is one of the reasons why we have developed pain in the muscles during physical exercise. So, in the absence of oxygen and lack of oxygen in the skeletal muscles, we have the formation of lactic acid. The same reaction with these of yeast cells in the absence of oxygen, namely anaerobic respiration. What we have received nothing but ethanol or ethyl alcohol, then it is called alcoholic. Under normal conditions, the glucose is completely oxidized in aerobic respiration. In the absence of oxygen under anaerobic conditions, it may be converted into lactic acid in the muscles or it may be converted into ethanol or ethyl alcohol in the case of actually sugar solutions where you are having the yeast. So then it is called alcoholic fermentation or lactic acid fermentation in the muscle cells. So we have different products are formed under different conditions created by the enzymes. So with this I can prove because of water time. So we have more about these enzymes in the next class. So if you have any questions, you are welcome to ask or post some questions in the next. Thank you. Class is complete.